Good afternoon. I want to thank the organizers of ComCare um, Conference for inviting me. I want to thank uh, Ms. Ruth Hogarth, um, our advisory board member of American Board of Independent Medical Examiners, Mr. Chris Argyle and eReports for sponsoring this. Uh, and I also want to thank thousands of families of injured workers that over 40 years gave me the opportunity to participate in their care uh, and learn a lot from them. So some of that experience that I've had in returning thousands of these individuals to gainful and productive life, I thought I'd share that with you by first defining the challenges. In a moment, I'll share that with you. Uh, unfortunately, now I have about 35 minutes, so I'll try to do the best I can, and then we'll have some questions and discussions. I will make myself available in the evening uh, at the e-reports uh, counter where you can come and visit me if you'd like to talk more about the key issues. I'm gonna suggest some solutions uh, to the issues of impairment and disability and the outcome, which is incapacity and not returning to work, and recommend some steps uh, that I, I have for you, recommended steps. Now, what do you see in this picture? What do you see? Uh, some people might see a duck and others might see a rabbit. It's all in perspective. If you see Oster, uh, Oscar Pistorius uh, in the courtroom, uh, you will see an individual who has bilateral lower limb amputation, uh, an individual who, according to any guides, will be about 50% plus impaired as a whole person. But I bet you he can run better than most of us and probably can shoot better than most of us too. So, so disability is all in perspective. So if you look at this fellow, he's Kyle Mannard. He was born without limbs. He will be about 90% whole person impaired. But his mother refused to accept uh, him as a disabled child and raised him as able. So he became then a professional wrestler and a champion. And he wrote a book, No Excuses. And I recommend everyone in this room who wants to know how to return individuals to gainful employment or productive life, they should read Kyle Mannard's story. So when we talk about claims of incapacity, uh, we need to remember that impairment does not equal disability. Disability is a very relative construct. As you can see from this slide, uh, this is part of the chapter I recently authored for Professor Bradham's book on physical medicine and rehab. And in that, I talk about <coughs> disability is actually dependent upon not what the injury or diagnosis or, or disease is, but who has it and in what environment. So for example, an individual on the top, if you see this individual, he is on a very tight trampoline. And a trampoline with the same amount of injury this person falls in, the displacement in that trampoline can be regarded as a disability. So this individual has a transradial amputation, which from any guides, including AMA guides, will give him about 58% impairment of the whole person. This person in the United States today, or in Europe, or for that matter, in Australia, can get a body-powered prosthesis, which will return him to about 95% of the function of the upper limb. Now, this individual may have a large impairment, but I would, I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the resulting functional loss is minimal because he has an environment uh, that is very tight around him with resources that are available to him. Think of the same individual if he was in Haiti and had a loss of transradial amputation, what, is, what can this person expect? A hook. And that's my point. Disability is a relative construct. And the challenges in disability we need to recognize there are a billion people in this world, and this is World Health Organization da data, that live with some sort of disability uh, in this world. Uh, disability claims have been rising in the United States in the last two decades. There has been a recent report of a 300% increase in musculoskeletal and mental and behavioral disorder disability claims in, in the past decades. The cost, the direct cost is about $253 billion, by, according to the Warren's data published in 2015. The indirect cost is about five times more. The cost that includes presenteeism, your employee is present but not productive, and so on. So the direct indirect cost can be even higher. And U.S. is not alone in this crisis. This is occurring across the globe. Uh, and, and I must tell you that, that the, this, this disability claim epidemic is a global problem now. 
and musculoskeletal disorder, which are currently the highest cause preventable musculoskeletal disorder, soft tissue strain, sprain, and so on, they are the higher, highest cause of disability or incapacity in the world. And it is predicted by World Health Organization that the mental and behavioral disorder, particularly major depression by 2020, would be the leading cause of global disability. So we must all in this business who are here need to be aware of this. So then the question I have, first a statement, then a question. Most people recover function as expected. Most of them do. Some even after serious injuries. I have been impressed by individuals who have had serious impairment or challenges, but they lead productive lives. And then I have also, I'm equally puzzled by individuals who have little or no discernible impairment, yet they perceive themselves permanently and totally disabled. And I'm sure many of you in this business know what I'm talking about. So the question then comes up is, how do we empower ability in disability? And what can we do to impact the outcome? It is all about the outcome. And how do we return these people to function? And that is very important. I must submit to you that a lot of things we have done haven't worked. So we need to think out of the box. And thinking outside the box means that we need to rethink the way, rethink the way we care, uh, not only, and when I say we, I mean us physicians mostly, and I'll talk about challenges at odd levels in, in, in a moment, but I think physicians fail their patients by lack of communication and, and not allowing the time to improve the coping and Resilience, which is a concept that I'm going to talk about uh, in a few minutes. I must submit to you that my colleagues on the physical therapy sides are much better than my medical colleagues who don't take time. Physical therapy profession as such is very tuned into return to work and function. And I think they should continue doing that because this is very important that all of us work together as a team. We need to go from an adaptive, uh, moving from a predictive model to an adaptive model. We need to start rethinking both at macro and micro level. What do I mean by that? So we need to rethink the system level. We need to rethink at the physician provider and the individual level. We need to think at all these le levels if we're going to have a dent in the epidemic that is occurring now and is about to even get worse. So what are those challenges? Challenges at the individual level, physician provider level, and so on. The first challenge that I see is what I call lack of autonomy or isolation that an individual feels after an injury. Many times I have had injured workers who will say to me, my employer doesn't care. After I hurt my back, I never heard back from them. All I heard from all these people, insurers, adjusters, everybody else, but my employer. So they feel isolated and that is important. In a moment, I'll talk about a model, what I call a SPICE model. I'm gonna tell you how that works, working together thinking outside of the box, how does that work for us to make an, a difference? The other thing that is very important is delayed recovery and, co and compliance by the patient. Delayed recovery means that when things become delayed, either in terms of approvals, therapeutic treatments, and so on, the good data, and I'm, I'm sure most of you know, shows that uh, an individual who does not return to work for three months, the likelihood of that individual to return to work reduces by <clears throat> 25%. At six months, it is half, and at one year, zero. So delayed recovery is a great challenge at the individual level. Comorbid, pre-morbid conditions are important. And then secondary condition. Deconditioning is important. The mo more a person stays away from work, the more deconditioned they become. The disability mind sets in, which is another psychosocial barrier, and motivational issues start coming into play. Psychosocial barriers, I'm gonna talk more about that in a moment in my next couple of slides. And then this is what I call good old day bias. How many times I've heard from my patients when I say, Joe, you can go back to work, but doc, I'm not at 100%. What do you mean by that? Well, doc, I could do this or I could do that. And I would tell them, Joe, old age is not for sissies. Middle age is not for sissies. Obviously you, you think what you are now 30, which you are now 50, and what you could do at 30, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that. Would I be able to cure your pain 100%? No, but you still can, you have some function and you can return to work. So my point is that there's this good old day bias we have that we need to overcome with communication with these individuals. And finally, the concept of resilience, which is 
popping back up after an injury, coping. Those are things, and I'm going to talk about how physicians should, and this is what we teach our residents and our fellows. So at the physician level, the problem that we have, the challenge that we have in returning people to function, and there's plenty of blame that can go towards physician. One of that is we, we use a medical, biomedical model. So there is an injury we find. We're very good at anatomically describing it. We are very good at looking at our imagings and so on and pinpoint the physical problem without actually considering a real person behind that physical problem. Then we throw in procedures, pills, pumps, shots, injections, and so on. Instead of thinking a biopsychosocial model, we use a medical model. There is also a lack of understanding for return to work and return to function among medical community. Why? I was never taught that in medical school, and I went to a pretty decent, good medical school. I was never taught in a residency program. It was not until I was a fellow in occupational medicine that it occurred to me that rehab involves sending workers back to work. It's much easier to write a certificate of sickness and then sending them away, and they are, and, and they are out there getting delayed and, and then going into permanent incapacity. So lack of understanding of physicians of the return to work is an important barrier that we must consider. And then there is indifference towards it. It's not my problem. Insurance companies should deal with rehab. It's not my problem. Or they are concerned about liability. Liability that perhaps if I send this person back to work and this person re-injures, I will be liable. So those, those concepts, those problems that occur. And then barriers due to time constraint. Doctors are usually busy. They don't have time. And doctors are poor team players. So they don't have time to, to, to work with rehab people or physical therapists and so on and say, look, help us. We need help. We have done what we could, but we need help to return this individual to gainful employment. And then, of course, lack of training and so on. Now, let's look at the system level. When I look at the system level, many times, and I am not sure about Australia, but in the United States, we find employers show a lack of cooperation. They usually don't like people to return to work until they are able to go full duty. The modified duty is a very important way to enter a person back into the work environment that will reduce the deconditioning, stop delayed recovery, and so on. So there is that system level issue, lack of employment cooperation, lack of payer cooperation. They don't want to pay for physical therapy. They don't want to pay for counseling. Lack of policies and strategies and lack of implementation. So these are various challenges we face, and we need to think out of the box to see how we can, we can avoid the web of disability. This is the web of disability, needless disability. I talked to you earlier that I'm going to talk about the, the mental and behavioral secondary conditions that occur, secondary conditions that occur uh, from, as a result of a primary injury. Majority of the time, that is what is the web of disability. So let's look at that. Why do some people fail to recover optimal function? Secondary mental and behavioral disorders. These are learned behaviors. Pain, chronic pain syndrome is a learned behavior. And the good news is it could be unlearned. Negative messages from doctors. Yeah, you're, you're never going to get better. Your back is always going to be like this. System, delaying it. All kinds of negative messages leading to anger, frustrations, catastrophizing. Oh my God, I'm dying. This is really bad. I haven't had this problem. There is no one who can tell Joe, you know, work is better for you. Work is good for you and less of work. Lack of work is not. In a moment, I'll show you some of the scientific data on that. So all of these are secondary conditions, and these secondary conditions are greater barrier uh, to return to work than the primary injury itself. It is very important for us to recognize that. And this leads to failure to recapture the optimal function and is the major cost driver for disability claims. Major cost driver. Uh, many years ago, before I went to law school, uh, I, and I was a physician. 20 years when then I decided to go to law school, I was medical director for my state workers' compensation system. And we used to find these issues, personal issues, biopsychosocial issues. You find a nurse who has worked for 25 years, and all of a sudden she's unable to return to work from a trivial lifting injury of the patient. And when you look at this, their psychosocial environment, you find the poor thing has to take care of a husband who has been tragically diagnosed with a stage 4 pancreatic cancer. So it is not her back, but these are other social issues. And, and this is very important for us to recognize that sometimes it is not the medical problem. It is the, the, the psychosocial issues are masquerading. 
as a, as a medical problem, which then doctors medicalize it. In a moment, I'll show you that. So what are the risk factors when you look at that? Most, uh, most, most problems are psychosocial, psychoeconomic factors, OK? So let's look at that. And this, this was published by Stan Bigos many years ago, which was then further um, uh, uh, supported and substantiated by studies in UK. The one, number one cause of a person not returning to work after a strain sprain of neck and back is what? Dislike of the job. Number two, dislike of the boss. Number three, last bad performance evaluation, right? Workplace conflict, uh, low wage, uh, and then lack of control on the task. Do you see any medical problem here? These are all psychosocial problems. So if you hate your job, if you hate your boss, you're about to be fired, and your life hurts, it's much easy for us to substitute and say, my back hurt or my neck hurts. And I'm not a bleeding heart liberal, and I'm not suggesting uh, th that, that this is that simplistic. But my point is that doctors need to move away from this biomedical model and start looking at the person beyond the injury. And they will find that there are lots of factors, lots of factors that are important, particularly a person who may have conflict at work. There is an old Chinese proverb, and I would submit to you, it says it all. Choose a job that you love, and you will never have to work a day in your life. And I think that's very important, very important for us to remember. So let's talk about my own thinking. So to me, work improves health and life expectancy. And I'm going to show you some data. Work improves life and expectancy, and I'm an eternal optimist, right? So thus, my question is, can I work despite my impairment and not am I disabled? And I think that should be the mindset we should try to, 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 to uh, insist when we come across these claimants. So there is a mountain of scientific data, and I don't have time for it. When I teach this workshop to my medical colleagues and I do it return to work workshop, I show about 100 slides of different scientific robust studies. But for this group, I have chosen only two to talk about. And those studies all show that worklessness, meaning out of work and drawing working age benefits causes poor health. And this poor health effect, both mental and physical, and this is robust scientific data to support all of that. And if any one of you is interested, I can send you references for you to see. And this is still seen after you statistically adjust it for age, for social class, poverty, as well as pre-existing. So you can't say that maybe just a lower class. Even Bill Gates has to keep himself occupied to make sure he doesn't become anxious or, 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 or depressed and so on. So I promised you some data. Randall published this uh, in Spine in 2005, and there's a slew of other data. And he showed that adverse effect of prolonged absence from work causes illness reinforcement, causes assumption of sick role, uh, deterioration in the family dynamics, uh, dependence on drugs, and creation of secondary gain and learned disability. Perhaps the best work in this field is by Professor Gordon Waddell and his colleague Kim Burton, which was published by the uh, UK Department of Welfare. Uh, and of course, it's a UK funded tax, uh, tax funded project, Gordon Waddell and Burton's work. <coughs> Professor Waddell looked at the entire world's literature, world literature. And they, they worked on this project for five years, and they published a very robust 257-page book. And the good news is it's free. It's available for you, free download, uh, thanks to the tax UK taxpayers. And um, it's a download. And, and here is your URL. You can even Google it, Waddle and Burton's work. It's a 250-page document, and they have all sorts of scientific data. So if you are interested in ever looking at the scientific basis for what I'm saying, it's all there in the literature, Waddle and Burton's work. Now, what they, and of course, I cannot talk about the whole thing, but I'll sum it up in two slides. And, and this is what they concluded. They said worklessness, worklessness causes poor health. They also said those out of ex work experience poor mental health. Anxiety and depression is two to three times more common. And they also say the worklessness leads to increasing smoking, consumption of alcohol, use of illicit drug, and risk-taking sexual behavior. And this is what they say. This is the most important lesson that I took from their work. Worklessness needs, leads to increased mortality. In fact, many studies have shown 
that individuals who prematurely take pensions benefits die 10 years earlier than their cohort. This has been shown in dozens of studies. Worklessness, needless worklessness, lead to increased mortality. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, if as a physician, if I was to write you a prescription and say, you know, this here is a prescription, get it filled by the pharmacy. By the way, the side effects are you will, you will uh, uh, ingest more alcohol, smoke more, probably illicit drug, and then you will die 10 years early. Would any one of you, any one of you, take that prescription and get it filled at the pharmacy? I reckon not. And why are we doing this every single time we give a needless sick certificate? This is a question I have for my colleagues, medical colleagues, who provide these certificates, right? So the final conclusion, the, the final conclusion from the Waddell and Burton's work was that the negative effect of unemployment, all of those are, that I've talked about, are reversible upon return to work. So you can return them to work and everything is reversed. So UK Department of Work and Pensions published something for doctors. And they say, and among other things, they say, a patient may not be well served in the longer term by medical advice to refrain from work. So they're saying to their doctors, they are not, you're not serving your patients well. And then, of course, this is a guide for registered medical practitioner, and here is your URL. And I thought I'd show you some data from here, from home. Uh, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, Faculty of Occupational Medicine. And they, of course, have a large statement, a position statement. But what is most important from that statement, among other things, they talk about something very similar to what I've already alluded to, is this. They talk about Burton's review, Burton and Waddell's review, and they talk about not only the effect of individual, loss of work on individual, but also on their children and the family. And I think that's a larger burden we need to look at. They talk about children, higher likelihood of chronic illness among children of people. In fact, this, in, this risk increases if both parents are out of work. And this is not just out of work because of economic loss of work or because the mills have shut down. This is early retirement, drawing disability benefits and so on. And they talk about psychosomatic problem in children. And they also say that it is very likely that the children themselves would be out of work for a period of time or over their entire life. And this is not just the ex cathedra pronouncement. This is real science. This is science that has been borne out by research. So the point is that there's a greater burden that we don't quite often think we doctors when we give these uh, work capacity or incapacity certificates, that not only we are risking individuals in front of us, but their children, the family, and ultimately the community and the entire society. So these are some very important points that the, that the uh, Australasian College of Physicians makes, including that as doctors, we firsthand see the personal tragedy, tra uh, tragedies of unemployment and work disability, and they say breadwinners become reliant on pensions. That's the key. Now, <clears throat> so how do you empower people who have um, ability but consider themselves disabled? So let's look at the physician level. So we humans, when we don't understand, what do we do? We avoid, right? We avoid. What else we do? We blame. So we blame. We blame others. And then what do we do? We seek explanation. Who do we need to seek explanations from? Doctors. We go to our doctor, we seek explanation, right? And doctors, we questions we ask. Well, I hurt my back. What does it mean? What do I have to do? Uh, and how would it work out, right? So here is an escalator. This is, I'm finishing up a manuscript on my next book, uh, which will be published uh, in first uh, first part of the next year. And this is one of the things I talk about in return to work analysis. And here's what happens. So I show you an escalator, how this medicalization occurs. So patient seeks explanation, right? Says, doc, my back hurts. The doctor, she evaluates this individual, goes through a beautiful analysis and makes sure there is nothing surgical or medical can be done, that it's a simple strain, sprain, and so on. So doctor says, well, you know, it doesn't sound serious. The patient escalates and says, but doc, you don't understand. It's really bad. It hurts. What does the doctor do? Ask a quiesis and says, well, let's get a CT to be sure. You see that? This is how things that are simple become complicated. 
And then what happens? This is the medicalization part of it, right? Here's my favorite cartoon, Dilbert. He say, says, I got a bad case of ergophobia. It's an abnormal and persistent fear of work, right? So you give it a name, ergophobia. This is medicalization. It comes from a doctor. And, and again, it goes the same. Physician behavior, uh, it reinforces the negative behavior from the patient. Patient seeks explanation. Doc, my back hurts. The doc goes through and says, it doesn't sound bad. The patient intensifies and says, but you don't understand. It hurts, it hurts really bad. At that time, if the doctor would have said, look, I have done a thorough physical examination. There is nothing neurologically wrong with you, meaning you're not going to go out here and become paralyzed. Uh, gives an assurance and, say, and says you can return to the activities that you tolerate. The doctor doesn't do that. Instead, what happens? Says, how long do you need off work? This is how, this is at this point, if it was intervened, you could have stopped delayed recovery. So there are multiple levels we need to rethink. Remember I told you, we need to rethink this process, not only at the individual level. It's easy to blame worker and say they are lazy, they don't want to work, they want to take uh, advantage of the system. Sure, there may be few of them. But not all of them. Similarly, there are a few bad doctors, but not all of them. I think instead of playing the blame game and pointing a finger at each other, what we need to re recognize is that it's all our problem, and we need to solve it together. That, that's something very important. So I thought I'd talk about neuroplasticity concept, brain's ability to reorganize. I looked at the, the, uh, your, your uh, schedule here of the program. There's a professor talking about this very topic, resilience and neuroplasticity. Uh, and so I decided not to speak a whole lot on that because you're going to get a presentation on that. So it's not uh, a good use of your time. I'm going to use a couple of slides to talk about neuroplasticity, which is repetitive environmental input changes our brain. So we constantly process our uh, input from, from our environment. And, and the more repetitive the input, the more brain reorganizes, the neurons fire together, and so on. This concept of neuroplasticity has been used as in positive, perhaps, for example, musicians by playing it, athletes, and so on. The negative messages can also lead to neuroplasticity or a behavioral problem, like playing a role of a victim, medically unable. So if the physician keeps giving negative messages and the others, what would happen? There is catastrophizing and then, of course, medically unable to work or disabled person kind of a concept. So it's very important that doctors and everybody else around the injured worker give positive messages that encourages coping and leads to resilience. So here is a SPICE model. Many years ago, we published on it. Uh, many of my colleagues and I, we published on it. And this SPICE model is very useful if you think of it in terms of implementing it as a team. It will not work if just one side of the equation worked. It has to be a team effort. So SPICE, S stands for simplicity, P for proximity, and then, of course, I for immediacy, C for centrality, and E for expectancy. And I'm going to go through each one of them. So simplicity is a very important concept, and this is an important concept for physicians. When simple conditions are treated in a complicated manner, they become complicated. This is very important. So if a physician does needless MRI, needless <clears throat> investigation, that gives a negative message to the patient. Why else this doctor would be spending thousands of dollars making me lay in this weird tube with all the noises around me? There must be something wrong. Do you see that? And I'm not suggesting that doctors should withhold treatment. We doctors are very good at determining whether there's on physical examination. In fact, that's part of our training. But the doctors, they sort of acquiesce to, to these testing because that's what the patients want. But instead of standing up and explaining to the patient what is best for you at this time is to not do anything, we complicate it by doing complicated stuff. So simple is good if it not, does not need. So, so if you treat a benign condition simply, it does not become complicated. P is for proximity. Proximity means to keep the claimant or the injured worker near the work site, which means that avoid the loss of work identity 
and by keeping the injured worker geographically and emotionally located near. What does that mean? That means that if a person is able to move, put that person in a seat somewhere answering phones. As long as they are at work in a modified duty form, it will keep, prevent them from becoming deconditioned. Uh, many years ago when I was a fellow, many, many years ago, 30 some years ago at NIOSH, uh, 35 years ago now, at National Institute of Occupational Health doing my fellowship in occupational medicine, part of our, our requirement was to spend six months as a plant physician, as an industrial site. And I was at Pittsburgh Steel. And we had 7,000 employees there and we developed a on-site physical therapy department. So a person never went out. If they had back strain sprain, they were put on, on modified duty and their duty was to show up for physical therapy. So they were clocking and come in. So the idea is you keep them hugging close to the job site and this leads to early, uh, early return to function, productive lives and so on. And I can talk more about this. I don't have time to go through the entire uh, how we reduced our, how we reduced our um, incapacity claims uh, almost down to um, five, which were at, at one point were, were about, at any given point, there were about 120, it says 13 minutes. That's, it says 13 minutes. Okay, so anyway, is it 13 minutes or five? I'm going to keep the 13 minutes. Okay, thank you. Proximity, immediacy is important. So action should be taken immediately. That's very important, which means that if something needs to be approved, it needs to be approved to prevent the disabled mindset. If you delay it, it will lead to delayed recovery. And then, of course, centrality and communication is the C. So centrality means the decision must be taken together as a team and there should be somebody responsible for it so the person is not lost to follow up. Communication means that, that very importantly, not only the team communicate, but also doctors communicate expectations, uh, time frames, and options with no false expectation and ease expectancy. The experience and research has shown that patients would love, live up to your expectations. And I can talk about John Lozier's data from Seattle, and I don't have time for it, but Dr. Lozier with his studies had shown that patients will live up to your expectation. If you tell them you will go back to work in four weeks or two weeks, they, they go back to work in control group. When you tell them uh, you can go back to work whenever you decide, we'll decide in four weeks. They have much reduced um, uh, return to work um, uh, percentages. So injured workers often fulfill the clinical and labeling expectations, so expectancy is the part of it, and, and hold then the worker accountable for it. So these are very important. Focusing on residual function and not impairment, that's the key. So return to function, physicians provide a role as I see it, that, that is to provide appropriate medical care, staying at work, assistance, and then, of course, prevention of disability mindset and return to work. So there are three areas you need, a doctor need to consider. One is risk assessment. Risk means whenever a doctor gives an incapacity certificate, the doctor must ask herself this question. Is there any reason that this individual will harm himself or the other? So somebody who has a poorly controlled seizure disorder must not drive a, a vehicle, right? That's no brainer. That will be the risk-based work in capacity. Other than that, the other capacities is the functional ability, which leads to limitations. So a person may not be able to do sustained overhead work, but that doesn't mean they cannot do all work. And finally, I want to talk about motivation. Motivation is a very important concept, and this is the bridge between impairment and disability. So here's my prime rule, if you want to remember, remember any of this. The prime rule is an individual if there is no objective evidence of substantial risk of significant harm, then the patient may return to work despite symptoms. Symptoms are not the reason an individual should not return to work. If there is a risk for harm, certainly there should be restrictions. But other than that, should should no, no restrictions. So when we talk about motivation, motivation is a personal issue, right? Motivation is a psychosocial uh, concept, is unique to each patient. And it can lead to performance which is below because of the pain or limitation of fatigue and so on. And it's influenced by personality, dislikes, and re available rewards. You remember we talked about how individuals, if they don't like work, the motivation is less, right? Some jobs are just not fun. This job is not fun. I don't think so. This job is not fun. This job is certainly not fun. 
right? And this job obviously is not fun at all. So some jobs are not fun. So then take home message for the doctors is the following, right? Focus on current function and not on diagnosis. Focus on ability and not disability. Very important, ability and not disability. And assist the patient with vocational adjustment and enable them to stay at work or return to work and communicate positive messages. What could be those positive messages? Here are some positive messages that are published in the literature. And let me give you those messages. Physical therapists, again, I feel like they're advertisement, but I'm, I'm truly impressed by how good outcome and results they have. And so back pain need not cripple you unless you let it. That's the key. Your injury need not cripple you unless you let it. So you have the empowerment. You can allow it to cripple you. Back pain is usually not to do anything serious, right? This is about back, but you can substitute it for neck and other strain is pain, okay? Cause of the work back pain are not always work injuries. It is surprisingly difficult to damage your spine. You really cannot damage your spine so easy by lifting. And bed rest is bad for backs. So don't ever authorize back uh, uh, bed rest. And exercise is good for you and your, and your back use, either use it or lose it, right? There are a couple of others, one more slide. This is important. Coping with aches and pains of life is a normal part of human existence. Coping. Aches and pains of life. And as you get old, stop worrying about the good old days bias. Co coping is important, right? And then copers suffer less. That is the key. If you cope, you, you less suffer less. And they're healthier in the long run. Be a coper. And prevent unnecessary suffering or frustration. Live life as normally as possible. That is the key. And then, of course... Keep up daily activities and try to stay fit. Take home message for the employer. I've got three more slides. So take home message for employer. A return to work, even in a light duty or modified position or with accommodation, also means the transition from incapacitated patient to productive employee by enhancing recovery and reducing delayed recovery and thus incapacity and disability. Modified work has been shown by good science to be the cornerstone to successful early return to work and lowers impairment and disability burden, which in turn uh, decreases your expenses. This has been shown by irrefutable science. So here are the two conclusions, two slides with conclusions, and I'm done. So the conclusion that I get from all of this that I talked about, <clears throat> disability claims are rising. Despite technical improvement in healthcare, 40 years ago when I was a medical student, we didn't have CT scanners or MRIs. They all developed ultrasound. They all developed in front of us, right? So healthcare technology has just completely gone through the space, but we still have disability claims that are worse than when you compare 30 years ago. Not working is bad for your health. It's hazardous. Very important message that we need to give to your patient. Majority of the individuals labeled as totally disabled are capable of performing gainful employment. That's the key. The behavior or disability claimant participants often creates a disability mindset. That's the key. And finally, incentives, motivation, and resiliency are more important determinants of disability than impairment. Focus on residual function. And this is also very important in psychiatric claims where people have a lot of diagnosis. It doesn't matter what diagnosis a person carries, what function they are able to do. And finally, disability is largely preventable, and I'm available for questions, and I thank you.